and without you guys building this community and building the startup, oh crap, and building Startup Metrics Toronto group, I mean, we wouldn't be here today. We've got about 550 members, which is absolutely incredible. So first of all, I just wanted to say a big thanks to you guys for kind of making this all happen. And uh, after I work out what happens to my presentation, I'll, uh, I'll get going on it in just a second. Um, so give me one minute, I guess. All right. I know, right? <laughs> I think it just fell asleep. We've got to reboot it. So we've got a lovely venue host here tonight um, from Wave Apps. Wave Apps is completely awesome. And how many of you here are from Wave? Just put your hands up. Yeah, all those awesome people to help us put the event together. Please give them a big round of applause for you guys. We would not be here tonight. And also a big shout out to, uh, to Sarah as well, but I think Sarah's still at the door right now. Um, but she's been organizing this whole thing and she's been such a great help. So Wave Apps, awesome guys. Thank you so much. We love you. Good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we're from OK Grow. Um, we're an app development firm here in Toronto and we work with uh, enterprises and startups to kind of build really cool, really disruptive ideas using lean methodology and our years inside startups and building applications ourselves. We love building MVPs. We love growing. Um, new businesses and new applications and new ideas, and this is what we're actually very, very good at, and excellent at, and we love continue, we love doing it. Um, our weapons of choice are uh, our Meteor and Rails, but more importantly, we like to use Meteor. Now, it's a new framework, um, but essentially, you can do in ten lines what you used to take you a thousand in some cases with old JavaScript. So we're excellent at rapid prototyping. We love building MVP apps. And if you want to get in touch and talk about a project or just jam on an idea. Just come and find myself, Paul Dowling, who's the founder, and Carl as well, right there. So onto, onto some fun stuff right now, besides our client list, ooh, whatever. The next event we have coming up, we've actually been selected as the live stream host for Toronto to do the Lean Startup Conference live from San Francisco. So we're looking to partner with, um, yeah, thank you. Um, it was a pretty cool gig. Last year, Mars was doing it. They may still do another one this year, but as far as we're concerned, um, we're going to be doing a live stream from December 8th to 12th, which is completely awesome. Um, it's a full week-long event, and you've got some incredible people from Dropbox and Google and Microsoft, Rackspace, and all those wicked, wicked companies um, doing talks on lean methodology, startups, and all that sort of stuff. So stay tuned for some more information about that. And then our next event, we're actually holding a media workshop. It's a brand new framework that came out. It's a very, very cool language, and if you want to know more about it and learn a little bit of Meteor, uh, we'll be throwing workshops on December 6th and 7th. And if you want to learn more after Justin gives a talk, again, find Paul and Carl. They're the, uh, they're the two developers and experts at Meteor. And uh, I'd like to say that we're you know, the top Meteor shop in Canada. We're proud to do it. We're listed right on the professional services page at Meteor.com. And we helped build the website, which is awesome. And then finally, ho ho to Guys, we uh, sent out an email today to all the members of uh, the Startup Metrics Toronto group. And um, if you use that coupon code, you get 10% off tickets to Ho Ho TO. Now, it's in support of the Daily Bread and Food Bank. It's a wicked awesome party. Um, and just come down for the holidays, support the Daily Bread and Food Bank, support the startup community here in Toronto, which is awesome and growing, and help us make some more really kick-ass events like this one and bring you really, really awesome speakers like Justin over here. So what does that mean? You should follow us on Twitter and Facebook to keep up to date with all that info. So if you haven't already, please go to Facebook or Twitter, um, like our page, follow us, and get news and updates about just about everything um, to do with these next couple of events we have coming up for you guys. And finally, we're going to give away three copies of Traction today to all you wonderful people in the audience. Now, the catch is you've got to tweet about it. You've got to tweet about this event on your Twitter using the handle hashtag startupmetricsto. Now, tweet about that one, and we'll pick three people at the end of the event, and we'll, we'll send you either a digital copy or a hard copy, your choice. And um, yeah, so hopefully one of you guys, or a few of you guys will walk away with some awesome swag. And not just stickers and stuff, but Coffee Attraction, which is a really good book. All right. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, and I'll have this up later, you can just send us an email or go chat with us after the event. And um, I guess with no further ado, I'm going to bring on Justin Ayers to talk about his book, Traction. Give it up, guys. Cool. Can everyone hear me? So I am Justin Maris. Thanks for having me, everyone. This is my first time in Toronto, so pretty excited to be here. Uh, it seems like a cool city, so good work. Excuse me, you guys popular. 
Uh, so as he said, I am the co-author of a book called Traction. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of this or know roughly what it is? Cool. All right, okay. Uh, so basically, we wrote Traction because we saw that most startups today are not failing because like they can't build a product, but they're failing because they can't get traction. Like in a world, like in today's world where there are 1,500 companies coming out of accelerators, uh, like seed incubators and the like every single year, and when seed funding is so plentiful, there's like thousands and thousands of new startups launching every single year. The hard part is no longer like building a product that can get funding, it's actually getting traction and building like a meaningful company that can grow, raise funding and get acquired, do all those awesome things. Uh, so today, I wanted to talk about a key component of traction, which is acquisition. So this is Dave McClure's kind of like classic marketing funnel, like acquisition, top of the funnel stuff, acquisition, which is getting someone to take a key, you know, take a key action uh, in your app, in your program, whatever. Uh, retention, keeping them involved. Revenue, obviously having them pay you. And then referral, having them refer your product to someone else. So activation is a super, super critical thing. Like, it is not only a key part of the marketing funnel, but it also impacts your CPA, like what you spend to acquire a user. Uh, how many of you guys do paid advertising? Well, how many of you guys have startups, first of all? Like, or work in startups, okay, cool. Uh, how many of you guys do paid acquisition? Okay, so what you see a lot of times, and I've literally seen companies like die because of this, uh, is you see companies that they run the numbers where they say, okay, we spend $1,000 uh, to acquire a new user and we make like 1,200 bucks. Like theoretically, you're making $200 on every person that you buy like running a thousand. Like lots of companies see that and they keep spending. What happens though is you see a ton of these companies uh, and I, I legitimately know one company that like died because of this, where they raised a seed round, they ran all the numbers, and they're like, "Oh, sweet, we can acquire users for like 80 bucks and make 100." And they ramped that, realized that, "Oh, we only have activation rates of like 50 percent, so we're actually losing money on everyone we acquire." Uh, and they like ran the money and that. So I don't want that to happen to you guys. You all seem like nice people. Uh, so I want to talk about why activation is so important and how you can fix it, make it better, and make it a really awesome part of your like, onboarding funnel. Uh, so in this talk, I'm gonna cover key ways that you can improve the activation and onboarding experience. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some stuff that I did at my lab company uh, that worked really well for us in terms of activation. And then I'll open it up for specific questions at the end. And in the meantime, seriously, if any of you guys have questions, want me to like, dig into something, just raise your hand, shout out, whatever, uh, let me know. I would love to like go deeper on something if I'm glossing over it or just want more, like, want to discuss it more. So previously, uh, again, Justin Maris, co-author of Traction Book. Uh, most recently, I was the director of revenue at Exceptional. So Exceptional was a, we had a product called Airbreak, we had another product called Exceptional, uh, a product called Redis to Go, all developer tools, uh, SaaS, so the exceptional story was kind of interesting. It wasn't really your traditional startup story of like a couple guys have an idea and then they sit around like hack on it, eating a bunch of pizza and like things that are terrible for you. Uh, you know, we actually acquired two products, like Exceptional and Airbrake, that did the same thing. Uh, they were small side projects, one run by an individual developer, another run by a consultancy. And what they did is they did error tracking for developers. So like a developer would install it, they would see when their app broke, uh, they would get like Intel and then be able to fix it. So what this meant is like when we bought the product, they already had customers, uh, but it also meant that the people behind these tools had never really focused on them as a business. Like when we acquired them, uh, we saw activation rates were roughly like 30%. So you know, for every 10 people signing up for the product, only three of them were actually installing and using the product. Not to mention like most of them weren't paying us. Uh, in one sense, that was why we thought it was a good thing to acquire because we could fix that. But I'm gonna walk you guys through the process that we went through 
uh, that allowed us to fix this entire onboarding activation experience and make it something that works super well for us. Um, <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Uh, it's an interesting Sorry. <laughs> uh, so the first thing, so yes, yeah, so we acquired this product and we were working on fixing the activation and onboarding. How many of you all, are you all like working on software companies, tech companies in some way? How many of you are like totally happy with your activation? Have no issues with it. <laughs> cool. So I hope this is valuable then. Let's get into it. So uh, basically, the first step, uh, we have Ben who wrote Lean Analytics in the audience today, I met with him earlier, uh, tracking. Like setting up Lean Analytics, great book by the way, if you guys want to like learn more about this. Uh, but basically, the first thing you need to do if you're going to improve your onboarding or activation, really anything in your business, uh, you have to instrument and set up tracking. So it is pretty much useless to try and improve activation or onboarding or whatever if you have no idea how well it's going already. You know. Uh, so we went through a process like, do you all have some sort of like something instrumented like a mix panel six metrics? So, tracking, number one, crucially important. The second step, the second thing that we did is we had to find our key engagement metrics. So, I'm, I, like, there's this popular story about Twitter, like their whole onboarding and activation process. Uh, they had a bunch of people that were signing up for Twitter, and then they found like a lot of people would sign up, never tweet, never follow anyone, drop off, and never return as promised. Uh, obviously, this is now, this is like a couple of years ago. And so what Twitter did is they spent a lot of time, like they did a bunch of data analysis and they found that users that signed up and followed five people within three or four days were far, far more likely to be involved to use Twitter long term than those that just signed up and left. That sounds pretty obvious, but they found their key metric, like a key uh, kind of threshold that showed them whether or not the user was likely or unlikely to be engaged was having a user follow five people. So today, when you sign up for Twitter, what you see is every single step of the onboarding process is designed to get you to follow five people. That's all they care about. You sign up, they say, here are some topics that you might be interested in, follow these celebrities, follow your friends if you log on to Facebook, follow these people that have recently gotten popular. And you literally have a bar where it's like, we want you to follow five people, you follow five people, and you finish the onboarding process. So with us, you know, we were a developer tool. After doing some digging, we looked at a bunch of data, we looked at like, okay, of the customers that pay us the most, of the customers that are with us the longest, what did they have in common? Like, what did their first week with Airbrake look like? And how was it different from those people that never ended up using us at all? Uh, we found that customers who generate a test error, so they sign up and they like literally click a button that's just like, send me a test error. Uh, they do that on day one, and then capture a real error within the first seven days of signing up. We found that those people were way, way more likely to be engaged, to be active, and to pay us at the end of their 30 day trial. Uh, this is like by a factor of four, like it was massive. If we could get you to do these things, you had a insanely higher probability of being a valuable user, of actually experiencing why this product is awesome, and getting a sense for like, and becoming one of the people, one of the customers that we could build a relationship with, and would, would stay with us over a long period of time. Uh, so, you know, what I would encourage you all to do is when you're thinking about activation, onboarding, all these really, really important things, is Figure out like what are your key engagement metrics. Um, you know, so I talked about Twitter's. For us, uh, we yeah we found out that these the were these. Ooh, sorry. Uh, these are the two things that we wanted people to do. We wanted them to generate a test error and then track a real error within the first seven days. And we instrumented our entire onboarding flow to get someone to accomplish that. So you know, before we had there were so many things wrong with our onboarding process. Like, we had something where once you signed up, you would tell us what programming language you're using. And then we would direct you to a website that said, like, here is how you install 
the snippet of code that we need for you to actually use a product. And then here's a little button that allows you, like, allows you to follow up on Twitter. And we put equal weight to this. Like, that is just the stupidest thing that we could have done, potentially. Like, someone who instruments and installs our app is so much more valuable to us than someone who like follows us on Twitter. Yet, we had them right next to each other. We removed the Twitter button, we saw way more people uh, ended up going through, I say this? No. Sorry, no. <laughs> uh, yes, we found that way more people ended up going through it. Uh, I would encourage you guys to think of this from the customer's perspective. Like, how many of you guys have signed up for an app, an e-commerce store, some social thing within the past week? Like, I know I've signed up for multiple. I am guessing, I could be wrong, but if you guys are anything like me, you have probably spent less than five minutes on a lot of those sites before you signed up, and you don't really have like an incredible sense of what the product is, what they do, what they're all about, and everything. It is so easy as a founder, as a marketer, to, you know, you know your product so well, you've been like pitching it, talking about it, trying to hire for it, raise money for it, do all of these things for so long, it's so easy to forget that a user that signs up for your product often has less than like five minutes, sometimes not even a minute, of experience reading your homepage and understanding what you're doing. For us, it was really easy to just say like, yeah, we're a developer tool, we obviously do this, and then you obviously want to know about all these other notifiers we have. You want to know about our Twitter account. You want to know about our email newsletter, about all of these cool things we have on the site for. In reality, that's just really confusing. I mean, just like you wouldn't ask someone to marry you on a first date, like, you don't want to throw everything at a user when they just sign up for your product. You know, it's like, it's kind of like getting punched in the face sometimes. When you sign up for a new product, and they're like, all right, do this, do this, do this, do this, and we have this feature and this feature. It's like, just overwhelming, it's confusing, and it really, really hurts your onboarding and activation rates. Um, you know, so, just, I would highly recommend, like, try and have some empathy for the user and just say, you know, okay, this person probably doesn't know what we do all that well. They certainly don't have as strong of an experience as I do with the product. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna lead them along slowly. Like, they sign up, you wanna keep things simple. We're at Airbrake, we do this one thing, take this one action, we'll talk to you like in a couple days after you complete this. Uh, so the couple things to keep in mind, like keep things simple. I gave the example of the Twitter uh, the Twitter account next to install our notifier earlier. That was just a really stupid thing, like only give people one action at a time to complete. Um, the other thing that's really useful is really try and hone in on your value proposition. Like, if I've only read your website for once, maybe twice, like, even then, I don't really have a good sense for what exactly you do. You know, like, for us, we thought it was obvious, you know, we're a developer tool, we have to do all this, but people didn't really internalize it because they didn't have experience with the tool. They didn't know, uh, they didn't know like, what it actually did, because they hadn't used it, they didn't know how good it was, they didn't know if it was something they were gonna use for like, months or years. And so by throwing a ton of information at them about all the different programming languages you can use it with, about all of the different integrations we have with like developer tools like GitHub, Pivotal, all these different things. It was just confusing people, and we ended up losing a lot of them. So don't overwhelm. So that is step two. So one, you have your tracking. Step two, you have your key metrics figured out. The next step in this is to map out your ideal customer flow. Like, in your dream world, what would every single customer who came to your website end up doing? For us, it was like someone would sign up for Airbrake, they would tell us what programming language uh, they are going to use. They would install our app, deploy it in a couple lines of code, generate a test error, and then actually track the real error. So in your like ideal world, what would each and every one of your customers do once they came to your website? Uh, a lot of times it'll look like sign up, take, you know, give, like take one key action. In the case of Twitter, like for their ideal users, it's probably like sign up, qualify people, send a tweet, come back like within 30 days, 
or within seven years. You know, so once you have this kind of ideal flow mapped out, that's when you want to think about and go through your current onboarding process. Say like, okay, where are people falling off in this ideal flow? Like, are there parts that are confusing? Are there parts that are not super clear? Are there parts that we make really hard for the users? Uh, for example, with us, we saw that uh, it was like 85% of people would sign up and then tell us what programming language they wanted to use. Then we saw of the people that told us what programming language they wanted to use and then actually installed it, that number was like 45%. So that was really, really low because after you told us what language you used, uh, we basically sent you to a page that had a bunch of like plain blue HTML links just saying like, if you're using JavaScript, here's a link to this repo on GitHub, which you then have to download and then like install and then upload and then deploy. It's just like a really, really complex cycle that uh, what just lost a bunch of people. Like oftentimes it wasn't even that a user didn't care about us, they didn't, it was more that they thought, you know, oh, I'll come back to this later. Or I don't really have time to do this now, I'll just like work on it later. Or maybe I'll check out like another product because this is just kind of a big thing to do. Uh, this is why a lot of people too end up adding something to a shopping cart. If you guys have e-commerce, any of you guys are doing e-commerce stuff, uh, a lot of people end up adding something to a shopping cart and then just leaving it because the barrier, like the mental barrier of actually taking out the credit card, typing it in, spending money, all of that is where people fall off because it's a very like high friction kind of process. So. With us, we, we spent a lot of time uh, fixing that one step that was just losing a ton of people. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, later on. So the next step, so you have your ideal flow. Uh, you have like, you, you have a sense, you have tracking, you know where people are falling off. Now you have to figure out why they're falling out in this certain step. This is where a lot of like growth hacky people would say like, yeah, just like A-B test it, like throw a bunch of things at it, see what happens. I actually think that's a terrible approach, especially in the early like days of a company where you don't have thousands and thousands and thousands of people signing up and going through your onboarding process. For us, we kind of did a, a big qualitative research project to figure out why people were falling off of this stuff. Uh, you know, that meant we set up a survey tool uh, called Qualaroo on this one step where people are falling off. And we just had this little pop-up that said, you know, hey, what do you think, like, what did you come to this page to do? Why have you not done it? Or what do you think of the instructions? How clear are they? So we got a ton of incredible feedback from people that was like, uh, I'm confused, I don't see my language listed, I'm not really sure what to do. We're in a weird situation in our deploy cycles where like we can't implement this right now. And so we learned a lot of really incredible stuff just by setting up that little tool and getting people to tell us like why they weren't completing the action. Uh, another thing that we did that was amazing was, uh, have you guys heard of a tool called Crazy Egg by chance? Cool, so amazing tool. I feel like way too few people use it. Uh, we installed it and it basically allowed us to see like someone's mouse as they went through our onboarding process. Like, we could watch them sign up and go through every step in the funnel. Doing that was mind blowing. Like that is when we that's when we figured out uh, that people were clicking on the follow us on Twitter rather than deploying us in their app because it was easier. And we saw like over and over again, people would just like drag their cursor to Twitter, hit follow, exit out of the page. And every time we were like, damn it, why? Why did we lose them? Uh, and we wouldn't have found this out if not for crazy. The last thing that is incredibly valuable and that so few startups do is call people. Especially if you're in B2B, especially if you're doing, uh, if you have like less than a thousand or even like 5,000 customers, calling people is just insane how valuable it is. Uh, for us, you know, first of all, not many startups call people. Every startup, almost, does drip Gmail campaigns where like you sign up and if you don't do a certain action you get like a bunch of email from them. Uh, that is super saturated. Like you, if you sign up for a product, it's almost assumed 
that if you don't take every action they want you to, you're gonna get a bunch of emails. And like, if you spread that across the 50, 60, 100 services that everyone is signed up for in today's day and age, that's just a lot of email that's just like pinging people. And you're just gonna get lost in that shuffle. Whereas, I don't think that I've had a company, except for GoDaddy, who I hate, but I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I've had a company call me in the last month. And there are so many services that I love. Like, if Buffer gave me a call, I would totally talk to those guys. That would be awesome. Uh, so seriously, calling people works <clears throat> incredibly. For us, we did one thing during the food search project where we had a bunch of people that were uh, like high value accounts that were gonna pay us thousands of dollars over the course of the year if we could only get them to activate and actually start using them. So what we did is we segmented out all these people. We said, okay, we want these guys to use us. They fell out of the funnel right here at the same place where everyone else did. What are we gonna do to get them back? So we sent all of them an email to schedule a call where we just said, hey, we will shoot you a $50 Amazon gift card if you hop on the phone with us for 10 minutes. Like, and every single person who got that email took us up on it. And we, we saw, not only did we make our money back with that, because like people signed up, we walked them through the process, but we figured out why these people didn't end up completing the key step that to us looked so easy. Uh, so that was like a massive, massive win for us as a company, uh, because before this, you know, we were, everything we were doing around marketing, content marketing, like social media stuff, uh, partnerships, all of this was just, getting lost because so many of the people we were driving to our funnel were just not end up using it. So this, not only did we fix it, but we actually got people to tell us why it wasn't working. And we got people to move through by just like incentivizing them with gift cards to tell us what wasn't working and why. The last, the uh, second last step is to rank. So you now have an idea of like, these are the things that are not working in our onboarding flow. Like, know why, or you have an idea, at least. Now is the time where you wanna start testing. So now is the time where you wanna go like, okay, here are all of the things we could potentially do to fix this onboarding problem. What are we actually gonna do? Now for us, you know, we saw, like I said, we saw that step <coughs> where people would sign up and they wouldn't install. We could've done a couple things. We could've completely rebuilt our onboarding process, it would have taken like six weeks or so. Uh, we could have, or we could have done simpler things like called everyone, uh, set up a drip email campaign so everyone who didn't do this step would get an email. Uh, we could have done like tool tips in the app where someone would sign up and then like they would get a little pop up that just said, you know, here's how you do this. Uh, by the way, I have no affiliation with this company, but they're really cool. Uh, so it's a company called AppQ, they, or AppQs. They basically allow you to build onboarding flows without having to like totally technically redo your activation and onboarding process. Really cool, uh, highly recommend them. Another great tool is intercom.io. Uh, both are excellent for this type of work. Uh, so basically uh, you want to rank the different things, the different steps you could take in order of potential impact and how hard it'll be to do. Like for, for us, almost definitely rebuilding the entire onboarding flow would have been the optimal move. Like it would have crushed it in every sense in terms of like uh, getting people through our funnel, but it also would have taken six weeks. And at the time, uh, it was shortly before the acquisition, uh, we were like doing a ton of stuff. We like were switching our back end, we were doing we were rebuilding the entire app. We just didn't have time to do all that, unfortunately. Uh, so what we did is we ranked all the stuff. We saw like, okay, we can install tool tips, we can call people, and we can set up drip sequences. Uh, so we ended up doing, like basically we set up these drip sequences, uh, did the calls, and then ended up doing uh, the app queues and intercom stuff, uh, which I'll get to shortly. So what I would say in this ranking step, what's really important is Focus on the steps that are earlier in the funnel. Like if you, if someone, if you see like a drop in people going from sign up to uh, whatever your key action is, like Twitter again, if they see a drop in people going from sign up to following five people, 
fixing that is going to be way more important than fixing like following five people and then not <coughs> The reason is, is because you get way more people coming through the funnel and like starting into the later stages. So focus like as early in the funnel as possible. Uh, a good way to think about this, and I'll illustrate with an example. Uh, a good way to think about this is like look at the different steps in your process that <coughs> have a lot of friction. Like this can be visual friction, this can be like just requiring a user to take massive actions that are not super useful. Uh, like for this, for example, you land on autotrader.com, you can say like, okay, here are the four things that I want. Then you get a search of like all the cars that you potentially want to buy. Compare this like relatively low friction approach to this other set I'm going to show you, wait for it, uh, <laughs> called Things Cars. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, you can see like she's saying, it's like, it's the worst site. <laughs> so, yeah, so one of those clearly has less friction and gets way more people through the funnel than Ling's Cars. Like, I have no idea how Ling's Cars is still on the internet, but somehow. Uh, so when you're, when you're evaluating this process, just look like, where are people getting hung up? Where are you asking them to do a lot? Uh, in our case, we saw like it's a big ask to have someone hit a page, go to GitHub, download a bit of code, build it into their app, deploy it, and then like install their API. Like that's just it's a big ask. It's a lot of steps without any direction. Um, and so that was the thing that we were going to focus on the most. The other thing that's really useful here is in ranking is to look for a leading indicator. So if you see that. You know, like if you, you can do this by looking at your data, like of everyone that canceled in the last 60, 90 days, like what did they have in common? What did they look like in the fourth week after they signed up? For us, we saw like a lot of people that didn't generate an error for two to three weeks were at a pretty high risk of dropping out within the next like month or two. And so when someone stopped generating errors, we just set up an automated email. So like, if you didn't generate an error for a couple weeks, shot you an email and just said like, hey, I noticed you're not fully utilizing your account. Like, just wanted to make sure that it's not a bug on our end. Just wanted to make sure that <coughs> you didn't have any issues. Because we want to make sure that we're like still tracking your errors and helping you out. Uh, and that got a really, really good response. And in a lot of cases, we saw that people would respond and say, you know, we, we still want to use Airbrake, but we ran into this issue. Or we want like this, this uh, notifier in this language, or whatever it was. So the last step is to test. So you have everything ranked, now you test them. So I'm gonna run through the, the different things that we tested, the different things that we did, uh, in order to eventually move our activation from roughly 30% to over 75%, which puts us in like the top of the class in terms of uh, B2B like onboarding and activation. So the first thing, lifecycle email. Um, I'm sure you guys know this, I talked about this earlier. It's kind of like standard at this point for startups to do this, but a lot of companies do it really poorly. Like I would highly, highly, highly recommend not doing this based on when someone signed up. Like not having a, oh, you signed up five days ago, we're gonna assume that you don't know what you're doing and so you like skipped all these steps. I would highly recommend saying like, okay, if someone installs the app but fails to generate a test error, they got one email. If someone generates a test error but not a real error, they got another email. And like we split this up so that we basically had our ideal customer flow and we would send out drip emails at every step of the funnel when people failed to complete them. So like if you went from step A to B, we would send you an email after two or three days of not completing uh, step C, which is like the next logical progression, uh, and just say like, hey, saw you didn't do step C, here's how to do it, here's how to make it easy. If you need to get in touch, like just reply to this email, throw it support, we would love to help. That was like a huge, huge win for us. Uh, also, it's great to end these emails with just an open-ended question, like, you know, what about our app is confusing, or what like, what is not clear, what can we improve? All these things are really good ways to word uh, these kinds of like drip and support emails. We found that saying, sending someone an email and saying like, what are you struggling with? Versus 
what is confusing about our app. They sound pretty similar, I mean, they roughly are, but we saw that people responded to the second one more than three times as often as they responded to the first one. Because in the first, it's kind of like, what are you struggling with? Like, why are you bad at our product? You know? And it's like, it's not insulting, but it kind of is. So when we changed that around, it was like, yeah, you know, we're, we're failing in some way here. Like, what is confusing about our product? What can we improve? A lot of times that triggered, like, someone's like, oh, yeah, it's not, it's not me. You know, it's these guys. It's these guys in that thing. And then they would email us and say, well, here's what I'm, here's, like, what you guys need to fix. Or here's where I'm a little lost. Like, can you help? So that worked really, really well. Uh, the other thing that, this is like the second <coughs> thing that we did, uh, is we did a bunch of customer education emails. So we had a email that went out to every person that signed up for the app. And we said, it was just like a one-liner thing that was like, hey, so glad to see that you signed up. If you have any questions, like feel free to reply to this email, we'll get back to you right away. And then the PS, we just said, you know, if you want to learn more about Airbnb and how like, we said, like, if you want to learn more about how companies like Airbnb, Stripe, Square are using Airbrake, just click here, sign up for our free, like, buy email educational course. Uh, not only did we get thousands of people doing that, which we then, like, sent our blog, like, blog team, all of that to, but it really helped people understand, like, what we did, all the capabilities we had, and all the amazing things that we had to offer that we didn't want to just, like, throw at them right when they signed up. Uh, like I said, we were very, very conscious uh, after a while of not bombarding people with a bunch of emails, or with a bunch of like, here's everything you can do up front, because that just confused them and didn't go well. The, uh, the next thing that we did uh, is we gave people incentives to complete an action. Oh wait, last thing, on the drip emails. Uh, one thing we did that was awesome is we had a small sales team, so every Friday, we would run a report and we said, everyone that has not completed this key step, uh, they got a drip email, so like they, they signed up and they didn't install the notifier. Of everyone who got that email and didn't open it and still hasn't completed the step, we'd run a report and we would just call them. We'd just say, you know, hey, saw that you didn't do this step, you didn't open our email, like what can we help with? How can we make this better for you? Like you signed up for the product, Obviously, you want to use Airbrake, like they do amazing things. Why did you end up not using it? Or what, like, what, how can we help? And everyone, uh, except one guy, was like really, <laughs> really happy to receive that call. Like, just, I, I can't stress enough like, how easy it is and how friendly people are when you pick up the phone and you call them not to sell them something, but just to say, like, hey, we're here to help. Like, we want you to succeed with our product. You signed up, you know, you clearly care about this, at least a little bit, and we want to make sure that you're successful. Uh, so that, highly, highly recommend it. Uh, so the other things we did, so we did, we gave people incentives to complete different actions. So when someone sent out their first error and they were like a pro plan or above, which meant they're paying us roughly like $1,000 a year. Uh, anytime they sent out their first error, we would shoot them a t-shirt, like to their billing address, shoot them a t-shirt and just say like, hey, Thanks for completing your first error. So glad to have you on as part of like the Airbrake customer family. Uh, you know, if you can ever need anything, like, just let us know. People loved that, like because basically they, you know, they're like typing on the computer, which that's what the software development is. Um, you know, they're just like spamming their notes. And then two days later, for an action they completed, they get a T-shirt in the mail, specifically addressed to the developer that did the deploy and actually did the thing. Users were like. They love that. Uh, we also did for smaller accounts. We like did something where we said, hey, you know, if you install Airbrake today, we have a bunch of these sick looking t-shirts and we would love to ship them one. You would not believe how many developers who make $150,000 a year will like drop everything they're doing <laughs> and do a deploy to get like a $4 t-shirt. <laughs> it's insane. It is literally insane. But it worked, and so that was something we did. Uh, we did other things where if someone like had trouble or they said, you know, hey, I'm not really sure how to do this action, uh, they're kind of close to their trial ending, we just said, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, if you take this action today, we'll just like extend your trial for free for like two weeks. Um, 
That is a no-brainer for anyone doing a SaaS business. If you acquire a customer and they leave, uh, that's just like the worst thing that can happen. It's, you essentially don't have costs to give people longer access to your software. So highly recommend doing that whenever you can. Uh, the other thing I talked about is we set up like app keys using uh, app keys and intercom. How many of you all have heard of user onboarding? <laughs> this website. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, they, I highly recommend it if you need ideas around like ways, better ways that you can onboard new users. Uh, you know, so this is this guy Samuel Hewick. He does an incredible job where he just like breaks down exactly what these companies are doing and what they're doing. So these are all like good things. And then they say like, here's what they're not doing. Well. It's, it's an incredible resource, gives you tons of ideas. He's done this for over 20 or 30 products now uh, of all different kinds. Like if you're doing a social app, you can kind of break down to that, SaaS, all kinds of things. Uh, so highly recommend checking that out. Um, the next thing that we did, and we did this not forever, but especially when we were trying to figure out you know, where people were falling off, why they were falling off, is someone would sign up and we would call them within five minutes and just say, yo, Justin from Airbrake, Patrick from Airbrake, like saw you just signed up. Why'd you do it? How can we help? What excites you about our product? Like why did you take this step? And how can we be useful? Uh, and again, people were super happy with that. Like a lot of times we would just be like, uh, we had one guy who signed up with a Gmail address and he was like, oh yeah, I'm just testing this out for Apple. And we were like, oh, <laughs> that's good to know. How can we be helpful? Uh, you know, and doing that kind of stuff, like not only did we discover a couple leads, like this happened again with someone with an Oracle who was running a small team, and it turns out like he was an engineering lead and then we spread with him to the rest of the organization because we did a lot of hand holding with him. Uh, but basically you find out the better it may sound. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we found out, you know, that talking to these people, not only did we get a sense for the good leads that were coming through, but it, we also got to see what did people think, like right when they signed up for the product. Why did you do it? What are you struggling with that made you uh, that made you like decide to sign up today? And then the answers that they gave us, we baked into our website copy. You know, like we baked into our email. Like, Oh yeah, I saw I had a bad deploy and we couldn't figure out like why this certain thing broke. Like, put on our website a couple weeks later, we tested a headline that was like, know why your deploy is broke. And it worked better than the headline we used before. Like there is no more powerful thing than really like parroting back what a user tells you in their own words as to like why your product is awesome. So again, calling people is incredible. Uh, last two things, and then I'll open up for questions. Uh, so, support. Support is critical. Have good support. Duh, I'm not going like, to go down that one. Uh, the one thing that we did that was really effective was we needed someone to have like a wow experience in the first 30 days. So what we did is everyone that signed up for the first 30 days, whenever they submitted a request for support, there was a little tag that was like new user. And all of those new users went to the top of our support queue so that they would see like Airbrick was fast, we were helpful, we were efficient, and we got like, we actually saw a meaningful bump in the number of people that stayed with us. Like, you send in a support, uh, support ticket, standard expectations are like you know, 24, 48 hours, you probably get like a bad Jarvis message and then you have to like respond and like go through this whole cycle. With us, it was like a couple hours we had to respond. Uh, it was from one of our developers, and generally, like we resolve the issue right there. That is a really, really good experience that makes you want to tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell your boss, like, man, the tool is awesome, the team is awesome, they're really on the ball, uh, as opposed to the more standard support experience that most of us get from shitty companies like GoDaddy. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually did this with. Uh, we had this amazing thing happen with uh, Airbnb. Like we saw that someone on their team submitted a support request. Uh, they were a massive customer of ours, paying us like tens of thousands of dollars a year, and it was kind of a big issue. And so uh, we saw it come through, and then we like reached out to them. They were both in San Francisco. <coughs> we walked over to their office. We bought like macaroons and walked over to their office, 
and we're just like, hey guys, saw you had this issue. Uh, we had it was like a little bit long to type in emails. We just want to show up and like try and fix it. When we walked in the office, one of the developers we talked to was like, oh you guys, oh yeah, we we're like a week away from canceling Airbrick. And we we're like, oh that is good to know. What's going on? Uh, and it turns out that they had this error and like they didn't, they weren't aware of an integration and a language notifier that was like literally a week away from us launching. And so we sat down with them and we were like, we fixed the issue. And then we were like, hey guys, you know, we're building this right now. If you want to hang on for a week, we can like give you beta access and give you priority, like whatever. Uh, and they're like, yeah, cool. We'd love to do that. And they've like been a customer for like more than six years now. Uh, I'm, no, I'm no longer with Airbrick, so that could be just all known for the last, uh, that could change the last couple months, but uh, they were still there when I left. We did the same thing with uh, Square. Like, we were building a, a big new feature. They asked a support ticket. They, they like, sent in a support question. We went over to their office, bought them lunch, bought them a bottle of whiskey, uh, and we're just like, hey, so here's like the support thing, we'll fix that, whatever. Here's this bigger thing that we're working on. What do you guys think of it? Like, what would you change? How does this, how do you see this fitting in your workflow? And their feedback, not only was amazing, but secondly, when we actually launched the feature, they ended up paying us like double what they were before because we were able to like sell it into a larger organization. We were doing a couple things that we did, uh, like just a couple minor tweaks that we learned from just talking to them and drinking whiskey. Uh, and for the record, Square's office is ridiculous, so we like try to go there as much as possible after that. <laughs> it was absurd. The last thing, cancellations. So cancellations are such a good opportunity to win people back. Uh, we set up something where we, where people would like, at, at the small plan and below, so people who are paying us like a couple hundred dollars a year, if you try to cancel, we just have like a little thing, you click cancel, little thing will pop up that was just like an empty box, and it said, you know, tell us why you're canceling, and we'll give you a free like two week trial extension, or a two week like free extension of our plan. A lot of people did this, they hit submit, we got another two free weeks, uh, and during that period, we would see why they were canceling. We would reach out with support and fix it. We would be like, oh, you know, you don't think we have this notifier. Like, here it is, we can install it for you, whatever. Or, oh, we fixed this long issue that now they're canceling for. Like, happy to do it. You know, we'll comp you like a month free or whatever. This was like a huge, huge win for us because just by installing a text box and a two week extension, uh, we won back like 25% of the people that were. The other thing we did, uh, this thing did kind of make some people angry, but not enough that it wasn't worth it, uh, is for plans pro and above, so people like paying us close to a thousand dollars a year. If you tried to cancel, you hit the cancel button, little thing would pop up that just said like, hey, you have to call us or something. Uh, they did, some people didn't like this, but for the most part, people were okay with it. One, because we told a plausible story of like, uh, which actually happened, we had someone, like a junior engineer on a large dev team that ended up canceling because he got mad at our product. But he canceled like the entire organization's plan, so they lost all their data, and it was like a really terrible thing. Uh, so we just told people when they called and they were angry, we were like, yeah, we just wanted to make sure this doesn't happen to you. Uh, but in reality, like, we were just wanted to talk to these people. You know, like, why are you canceling? What is pissing you off about Airbrick? Uh, and we ended up saving 40% of the people that were gonna cancel that were gonna like, call us. Like, this is thousands and thousands of dollars per month of what would have been lost revenue that was like still going into the company. So those are a bunch of the things that we did. Uh, like I said, we ended up going from around 30% activation rate to close to 75%. Uh, all of these things are tests that we ran that worked. Uh, well, a lot of these worked. It wasn't like a perfect process, obviously. Some of these things. Uh, didn't work, some things made people angry. But in general, like this is the process that we went through to massively improve our onboarding activation. Uh, and it made us a much better and a much more valuable company. So I would love to hear your guys' questions, hear like what issues you're having with onboarding activation. Uh, yeah, so let's open it up. We asked for it. Optional, forced? Optional. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, so we, it was optional for most people for uh, pro plans and above. So like generally businesses and enterprises, we forced it. So uh, you know, if you selected a, a a high plan, then we said you know we want to be able to reach you in case of an emergency. So. Yeah, so I like to think about what do you want your users to say to their buddy, their colleague, when they're talking about it? Like, whatever that is, that is your value prop, and that's what you should focus on. For us, it wasn't, we didn't want them telling their colleagues that we had integrations with GitHub, that we had integrations with Pivotal, that we had all these different programming languages that we supported. We wanted them telling their colleagues, like, Airbrake allows me to track my errors and save me time. So, Everything we did for their first interaction was just like pounding that into their heads that like you sign up for Airbrake, right, you save you time, and you get more information about your errors, it's gonna be like ten less time to bug. So that was reflected in our email copy, that was reflected in what we had them do, that was reflected in our first like phone calls and interactions with them. Uh, yeah, and so we like just gear everything towards really communicating our central value problem. Does that make sense? one that we found was why did you come here? You know, like, what are you looking for? Uh, that was uh, that was valuable for a couple reasons. One, we found that a bunch of truckers were coming to Airbrake.io. They were like, <laughs> you know, apparently an Airbrake is something that like stops them from crashing. <laughs> and so we were like, okay, that's an SEO problem, we'll fix that. Uh, but secondly, we found like developers who were coming, people that actually we wanted to use it. Uh, we got to see like what they wanted to solve, what problems they wanted to solve, and the types of words and language they used on the home or not on the home page uh, to describe the problem they were trying to solve with our software. You know, a lot of times it wasn't like I want robust error tracking. It was a lot. It was a lot more like I want to figure out what went wrong when my ship broke last week. You know, <coughs> and we obviously didn't say like see what happens when your ship breaks on the home page, but we like use the language they used, put it into our copy, and it ended up converting a lot better. But that was the best question to answer, for sure. On the home page. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about uh, drip emails. Uh, in Canada here, we have this thing called Castle, which is an anti spam law. Have you had to, uh, have you had to deal with people who were concerned about uh, spam? Or yeah, for sure. Email? Uh, but if you sign up for a product like in the TOS, it basically says, you know, we put that little box and we're just like, we have the right to email you, we won't stop your email and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we weren't just sending like cold email to people, uh, which, we, you know, we have a can spam as well in the US, but if someone signs up for the product, you're allowed to email them, basically. Is it, unless I'm horribly mistaken about what you said. Okay. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? So a couple things. One, I would see, is it like, is it the type of customer that we want more of that is asking these questions? Or, because you know, we had a premium pool. So we wanted more squares and Airbnbs. We didn't necessarily, not that we didn't care, but it was less important to us to build features that like individual developers want. Like the dude that is installing them for free on a side project. What the features he wants are vastly different, like quite frankly matter a little less to us as a business. Uh, so one, we evaluated but is this the type of customer we want more of? If it was, then if it was actually on our roadmap, we would say, you know, yeah, it's on our roadmap. Here's like the things that we're building before that. We'd love to hear your thoughts on what we're working on until then. Uh, if it wasn't on our roadmap, 
we would just say, you know, hey, this is an honor roadmap for this reason. This is what we're working on instead, which we think will like deliver a better customer experience. If you just disagree, like I'd love to hear why. And so just kind of like establish the conversation, not just like, uh, nope, we're not doing that. You know, <laughs> like, that just doesn't work. <laughs> Customers who didn't activate because they didn't need the, the functionality of the product right now, but did yeah. eventually. And have some oh, yeah, a bunch of truckers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we had a couple that they didn't activate because they didn't need it right now. Uh, a lot of them just like opted out of the drift email, you know, and we would then see some of them sign up later. Uh, but in general, like those people, not that they're not worth tracing, but they're like a pretty small percentage of people, at least for us. You know, we didn't have a lot of people like signing up, like, oh, one day I'm gonna use Airbrake, you know? It's just like, it's a developer tool. Like, it does its job. It's not like super sexy or interesting or anything. Uh, and so, generally, if you sign up, you wanted to solve a problem, like, right away, you know? On your drift email, like, when you ask questions, what's the percentage of user actually on the first email? Or oh, on any email in general? Like when you yeah. go back and ask, like, do you need help? Sure. So, so the first email, which was the open ended, like, hey, thanks for signing up for Airbrake, how can I help? We got like a 31% response. Uh, on the later emails, I honestly can't remember because there were like six of them, and I'm not sure how responses broke out on a per sequence basis. Uh, we had fewer people responding to the later ones because often they they, people got fewer of like, we had fewer people that didn't complete like the last step in the funnel. Uh, and in general, if they didn't complete that last step, they had already like reactivated by one of the earlier drift sequences. So we called them or they'd unsubscribed from our drift sequence altogether. Cool. Uh, um, how many companies have you booked to drink? <laughs> The answer is zero, actually. <laughs> but we're giving we're giving yeah. away three copies. So as as Michael mentioned, anyone that's that's tweeted with the uh, with the hashtag, will will randomly pick out three people at the end, and we'll send you both. Can I win? <laughs> You're just Paul. So, so Paul, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to insult you, but I work with massive. Uh, my name's Aaron from Vantage Analytics. We're massive fans of Waze, 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 and Waze. <laughs> Um, and uh, big, big fans. And I've just been blown away by your talk. It's been great. And uh, we're working on some stuff to kind of help small, medium-sized businesses. And I would be happy, on behalf of Vantage, to pick up a copy for anyone that gives me their business card. And we'll make sure that we send a copy of your book out to anyone that leaves a copy behind. Sweet. Thanks, Aaron. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. social services do it, like little boxes that pop up and it's like, hey, click this button to do this and all that. They have built these onboarding things, like these features, uh, because they have hundreds of millions of dollars in VC, they have massive teams, they have like 30 person growth engineering teams. Uh, app queues and intercom are just ways that we as a smaller team could kind of like get at some of the, that functionality. But in general, it works really, really well. Intercom especially has these tooltips where you can say like, hey, here's how you do this one feature, and then there's a box at the bottom where they can actually respond to you and say like, hey, you know, I see that this is what I can do, but I'm still kind of confused, uh, you know, and that was hugely useful for us. So I would say it worked really well. Uh, I don't really have any best practices there, because it's very app specific, and it's very specific to what you're doing. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. Um, so the question is, uh, who's, who sort of champions the onboarding, I guess, initiative, and how do they compete against the other priorities? Sure, so like what team in terms of? Yeah, or yeah, so say within your development group, or within, yeah, within yeah so. Who's responsible for 
Yeah, making sense. So that was actually, so onboarding was marketing and sales. Uh, basically, we were, you know, we're a small team, so we didn't have like very, you know, we were 22 people in our part. Uh, so we didn't have like strictly delineated team. Uh, so basically, I would, I did some of this data research and I was like, uh, got a bunch of good stuff and found out, you know, a lot of people are dropping off of this stuff. Yeah. Then I would present to the development team and say, you know, I think that this is so important that you take priority mm -hmm. over fixing this bug over here. Yeah. Uh, that was just like a weekly exact meeting that we went through. Um, but in terms of like calling and building out these marketing kind of funnels, yeah. uh, that was my marketing team and then the sales, like account management team as well. Question. Could you talk a bit about list fatigue and churn within the list once you get into marketing? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. That applied less to us for onboarding just because we weren't slamming them with a ton of email. Uh, even after the drip sequence, we had them, they had to opt in to our blog and newsletter. So we didn't like auto put them on that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, list fatigue is important, especially it happens a lot with e-commerce companies where you're like sending deal, 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 deal. Uh, for us, we didn't do any sales. Like, we didn't email our list a ton. We had like a monthly newsletter. And then you would get, you would get a bunch of emails when you signed up if you weren't taking the actions you wanted to. Other than that, you'd probably hear from us like once a month, once every two months. So it wasn't really a problem for us. But it is something that like a lot of companies struggle with for sure. Is there anything like I can go deeper on that if you want to see that? I would love if you can go deeper on that. It's, okay. uh, the more we market for people who sign up on our list, and we're talking light marketing once a month, just like you suggested, but uh, we've had people on there for years. So now if as things grow in the company, Expands, there's more and more communication. People are feeling overwhelmed. They don't understand what it is that's going on. So it's like as you diversify the different things. So what are they doing? Are they unsubscribing, or are they just like marking them as spam, or are they complaining, or what? Very few unsubscribed, under two percent, uh, okay. and just lack of activity. I see. Okay. Uh, for us, we did special segmentation around people that did or did not open or respond to certain campaigns. And then we would talk to those people in a different way than like the people that were opening all of our emails. So uh, we did this for traction book too. Like people that were on our list and didn't respond to our five emails about marketing or about like the book launch and all this stuff, uh, we put them on a, <laughs> a, a email list that we called losers. And, <laughs> and uh, we just sent them one final email and it was like, hey, you sign up for this, this is what we're doing. Uh, if you don't reply to this, uh, where you don't click the link, like we're just gonna unsubscribe you and wish you the best. And so we just did that, <laughs> like cleansed a lot of our list. Uh, so that that fixed the issue, and now we got like better tracking and data and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So segmentation, I think, is like the best way to fix that issue. Hey Justin, could you also requalify those tired old people on that list with a, a simple poll, uh, like reaching yeah. out, asking about? What can we do to help you? Or, uh, or, or Why do we you blame ourselves because you're not communicating? What, what totally, that, yeah, yeah. You know, that little reverse move? Totally, yeah. So we, we tried that where it was like, you know, we've sent you a bunch of emails. Uh, you know, if there's a reason you're still interested in this but not opening your email, like, let us know. Otherwise, we're just going to unsubscribe you. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they had to opt in to the one sequence that was just purely educational. So one, they wanted it. Two, it was like five emails or seven emails. So it wasn't that much. Uh, and also the trip stuff. Uh, we used a tool called Customer.io that is really good about, it, it like auto associates. So we just set rules like, don't ever send someone two emails on the same day. And like, it just would kind of like tweak that on its own. So it wasn't, it wasn't like, we didn't have to do a bunch of custom. Anyone else? So it's a really quick question. Watson mentioned that was customer.io. Yeah, customer.io. Yeah. Cool. You mentioned a lot of tools. Like, which one is your the one that you're not rolled out? Intercom. Intercom.io is amazing. 
Yeah. AppQs, uh, no, not AppQs, sorry. They do AppQs. They do customer I.O. like features. They also act as a database. They also mm -hmm. have some CRM like features. It's, it's an awesome tool. Yeah. The founders of Intercom actually, we were the, we bought exceptional from them. So funny enough. But I have no stake in Intercom, so they're good anyway. Data, uh, it's not super useful beyond that. Uh, otherwise, we use Mixpanel, heavy Mixpanel user, and um, Intercom IO. Those are like the main data driven tools we use mm -hmm. to track, like, you know, funnel customers, all this stuff. Did, yeah. you, did you use any of the usual marketing um, and PR things like social media? Uh, like like a Hootsuite or something like that? Well, as in like your traditional marketing channels. I know you were doing Oh, yeah. Like, did you use any of that at all, like paid or display? Or yeah, yeah. So we, we did a lot of paid. We did a ton of retargeting. Uh, good bit of social ads. Good bit of like social retargeting. Um, Content marketing. Yeah, so we did a good bit of that. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a primary focus, honestly. Like it was a profitable channel, but developer tools is a really competitive space to do paid acquisition in. So it, it didn't like scale because we didn't raise any money. Uh, and so we couldn't compete with New Relic, who was buying a customer for $1,000. Like, we just can't sell. Anything else? I have a question. So at, at OK Grow, we're, we're big fans of, of being data driven. And I, I recommend you use onboarding tools that you guys have used successfully, things like Intercom. And, uh, and, and in fact, I, I noticed that I was a user of, of Airbrake before with Airbrake when it was hopped out. And, I, I no way. and then after so the acquisition, I, I noticed that a, a lot of things started happening in terms of uh, like things like intercom started going in. So I, I'm wondering if, if you, this is not gonna be an easy question to answer, but I'm wondering if you could like maybe put a, put a guess in terms of a number or something on, on like how much more it helped by being as scientific as you were and by bothering to do these things like segmenting your list and use these tools yeah. and do all this sort of like uh, email correspondence with at very five, five cycles? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, mm -hmm. So the answer is massive, it was massively helpful. Like when I say we went from 30% to 70%, if you signed up when you were on Hopto, you were one of the 30% that made it through in the early days. Uh, so we rolled out all this stuff for new people that were signing up for the product and then like back implemented stuff like intercom, like email marketing, to people like you who had signed up like five, six years ago. Uh, so you probably didn't see a lot of the stuff we were doing because you were already in the funnel. Um, you probably weren't paying us, or were paying us like less than 10 bucks a month, is my guess. Am I right? Weren't paying? Yeah. Were you paying as an individual? We, as an individual, no. Okay. Yeah. No, but we had, we had, generally it's just something we use for every app. So every customer, they would be on a plan Often a, often a starter one, so I, see. Okay. So I did get yeah. to see a lot of the stuff that you were doing. Got it, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it was, a, it was a massive help. Like, you know, it is, especially for instrumenting, like, and seeing the steps at which people fell off. One, knowing what steps people are falling off and not having it be like this black box where something isn't working in there, super helpful. Uh, and what that meant is we could then build experiments to try and move that specific number and see if like drip was better than calling people, which was better than tool tips and all of this kind of stuff. And then we just like figured out what was best, so like double down, and then like tried a new experiment once that kind of like topped out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really, really helpful. Anyone else? I had nothing but good service from GoDaddy. <laughs> <laughs> that is surprising. <laughs> He just likes their ass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he just likes Dan's guy. That's what we meant. Um, you talked a lot about what worked for you and how it's successful. Is there one thing that you say you, you know, would have avoided had you known? Yeah, uh, calling people multiple times did not work as well as I thought it would have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that wasn't great. Uh, we 
did a couple. So when I say it, like the way I say it, it sounds like, oh, we had this beautifully spaced trip sequence that was just amazing, and like everyone loved it. But in reality, uh, the first iteration of our trip sequence, we sent people like eight emails in six days. And they hated it. <laughs> they hated it. Yeah. Rookie mistake in my part. <laughs> so it, it, it was like a process of evolution, for sure. So uh, don't send people more than one email a day. Um, yeah, don't just like keep calling people if you know, they're not answering or they're getting angry. Um, yeah, all of these things were painful lessons learned. <laughs> Um, you said you had like a 10 minute phone call scheduled with these people. Totally. Did you find there was like a most meaningful question you asked or would it have been better kept to like one or two minutes? Oh no, so generally like 10 minutes, it was almost always a half hour conversation. You just ask for 10 minutes and they like schedule 10 or 6.30. Because um, no one like blocks out their calendar in 10 minute chunks anymore. Because <laughs> it's just like annoying to do that in Outlook or Google Calendar. So everyone blocks out their calendar. Yeah, so best questions. Uh, one question that was amazing for upsells, actually, is just like, hey, you know, we're delivering this value, this is what you're doing. Uh, we want to be like an incredible partner for you as you grow your development team, as you're building out your product. Like, what would it